defines you? Does your work define you? Being a student, does that define you? Being a mother or father, a friend, a brother or sister, do those things define you? What I love about God's love is that that is the one and only thing that is at the core of who we are, and that is what defines us at the very, very core of who we are. When we fail at all the other things, we can come back and be reminded of God's love for us. And it is that love that defines us. It is through that love that we can live. And I'm just so thankful for that. Y'all may be seated. Uh, it was a while ago where uh, this church was nothing but a dream for Hannah and I. And um, when it was a dream, I, I kind of knew that God was calling us to plant this church. And, and there was a few things that I had to do. And one of those things was cast the vision and share um, kind of this dream with other people. And I had an amazing opportunity to uh, share this dream with a, a group of people, a group of leaders and pastors from our denomination. And uh, I sat on stage where well, there was hundreds of people, and uh, I kind of told this vision, again, when it was just Hannah and I, and I think Benny might have still been in Hannah's stomach. And uh, after I, I, I shared the vision, it was after the event, this guy comes up to me and says, hey, I don't know exactly what you have envisioned, I don't know exactly how it's all going to work out, but whatever it is, Ben, I want to be a part of it, and I want to help you do that. Jonathan Elgersma is that guy, one of the first adopters, if not the first adopters of the boulevard. And without Jonathan's support, without Faith uh, Reformed Church in Zealand's support, we could not do what we do here on Sunday, here in life groups, or how we impact the community throughout the week. So uh, I invite Jonathan up here. Um, he's going to be preaching the word of God today, which I'm really, really excited about. Jonathan, it's a pleasure to have you. And, I'm thankful for your friendship and thankful for your support. Awesome. Uh, first, thanks for inviting me here today, and then thanks for living into what I believe God wants to do in in Holland and really in West Michigan. Uh, you have no idea how important you are. We have a ministry at Faith Reformed Church. It's called Breakfast with Baby. We've been doing it for about ten years. On any on a Saturday morning, once a month, uh, there's a group of people that come, and they come for breakfast, and they come for infant formula and diapers, and then we have a store set up where people can get clothes for their children. One of the things that's been a reality for us is we have anywhere between 20 and 30 families that come, and as I look out at that, that mission and that ministry, it's filled with people who are of different cultural background than the people of Faith Reformed Church in Zealand. And what I mean by that is it's a lot of white people who are part of our community and a lot of Hispanic, black, and Asian people who come to, to breakfast with baby. And here's the truth. And we know that it's the truth. We want and would love for those folks to be a part of mission and ministry and to join us on a Sunday morning. But they're not going to because we don't look like them, we don't talk like them, we don't live life like them. They're our friends. We love them. And yet, for them to become a part of our community was never a reality until we started talking about being a partner at the Boulevard. You see, people who are part of Breakfast with Baby Ministry and people who are part of Kids Hope and people who are part of Hand to Hand Ministry, all those places, you are a church that represents our community much better than we ever do. So you need to know from the get-go, you have started doing something that no one else is doing. And yet this is the most reflective expression of the kingdom of God I've ever seen in the West Michigan church. Right. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And with that together, let's pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we gather, as we gather as the body of Christ today, our prayer is simple. Will your word speak a word into our world? And with that word, will you create life? 
And with the life that you create, will you help us to create even more life? Lord, I pray this morning for a particular blessing upon the boulevard. I pray that you will cause this ministry not just to be faithful and not just to be beautiful, but I pray that this ministry will be abundantly fruitful. Yes. Lord, we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning, uh, from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, uh, Jesus is teaching and encounters a variety of different experiences. And so, uh, Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 1, I'm only going to read the first seven verses. The tax collectors and sinners all came to listen to Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to complain, Look, this man welcomes sinners and even eats with them. Then Jesus told them this story. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep but loses one of them. And he will leave the other ninety-nine sheep in the open field and will go out and look for the lost sheep until he finds it. And when he finds it, he happily puts it on his shoulders and goes home. He calls to his friends and neighbors and says, Be happy with me because I found my lost sheep. In the same way I tell you, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who changes his heart and life than over 99 good people who don't need to change. <coughs> Jesus searches for us. When he finds us, he gives Jesus great joy and he invites us into the joy of finding others. Jesus searches for us and when Jesus finds us, it gives Jesus great joy and he invites us into the joy of Others being found. I was in Buena Vista, Colorado. I was at a place called Trail West. They were doing an orientation for people who were new to a ministry by the name of Young Life. I was still trying to figure out why I was there. I had been a bit of a knucklehead in college, didn't make all the right choices, didn't always live. Saturday night to Sunday morning. Somehow, Jimmy Buffett's great line of, there's a thin line between Saturday night and Sunday morning was a part of who I was. Throughout the week, they had talked about the levels of expectation for the people who are part of this ministry. Throughout the week, they had talked about what kind of behavior and what kind of expressions of life we should give. And throughout this, I kept feeling that inner voice within me say, Asking myself, what are you doing here? You are not like these people at all. What are you doing here? You're not worthy of any of this. Who do you think you are? Do any of you know this inner voice or is it just me? The familiarness of that inner voice that tells you that you don't fit in. As we continue throughout the week, that, that weight just continues to grow inside of me. And I didn't dare speak it to other people. I didn't realize at that time, at the age of 23, 24 years old, that that's what mostly everyone else was experiencing too. I, I was just living in that moment of, I am not worthy. I should not be here. Who do I think I am? And, and at the very end of the week, they decided to do this communion service. Or they, they worshipped and sang and someone shared a message. And at the end, we were going to partake of the table. The body of Christ. The blood of Christ. And I had decided as I was sitting there that there's no way. I just could not take communion that day. I decided that I, I just, and I had positioned myself well. I was in the middle of a pew at the very back in order for me to experience communion, someone would have to cause a miraculous thing to happen. And so the, the pastor that day they went through the institution, and after the institution, they sent elders out into, sent elders out into the congregation to serve communion. And what happened next changed my life forever. 
And we'll get to that in just a minute. In the text that we're reading today, we find Jesus having a conversation in really three different settings. The first setting is he's gathered with tax collectors and sinners who are listening intently. They, they want to hear the message of the kingdom. The, the people who don't fit, the people who aren't supposed to be there, they're in the front row and their eyes are wide and their ears are open. And, and as this is happening, in the second row, in the peanuts gallery, there's another group of people who are incredibly religious and yet without relationships. They're called scribes and Pharisees. A Pharisee was someone who paid great attention to all the detail of the law. And scribes were people who wrote down. They, they didn't have photocopiers back then. So they wrote down the scriptures. And so scribes, people who attended the law, and scribes, Pharisees and scribes, and they, they watch Jesus. And in grumbling and in complaining, they say, this fellow welcomes sinners. This, this fellow eats with sinners. And so there's the first setting that we find Jesus in. And into that setting, Jesus tells another setting. He tells them a parable, a, a story that comes alongside of life. And as it comes alongside of life, it explains the life that we're living. Or even better, explains what the kingdom of God is like within the life that we're living. Jesus tells the, the story of someone who has a hundred sheep and one of those sheep is suddenly lost. And, and he makes it personal. Which one of you, if you had a hundred sheep and one of them was lost or had wandered off or gone off by itself and gotten itself lost, which one of you would not leave the 99 and go in search of this one? Which the first question we have to answer would we do what Jesus has done for us in going searching for us? And then, and then Jesus, then Jesus does something that I think oftentimes gets missed when people read Luke 15. You see, Luke 15 has three stories in it. It has the story of a lost sheep, as the story of a lost coin, and then it has this provocative story of two sons, one that's older and one that's younger and a father and the, the one that's younger decides that he's going to go off by himself and ruin his whole life. And, and really, I'm going to invite you to read those stories yourself from chapter 15. But I think it gets lost in this first story of what happens next, that, that when the sheep is found, there is such great joy and such intimacy that the one who finds takes the one who was lost and puts them on their shoulder. Many of you ever lost a pet, a dog, a cat, a ferret, a raccoon, a monkey? <laughs> My wife grew up in Dr. Doolittle's home, and so those are all possible options. <laughs> and if you want to ask her about those stories later, she would love to tell you about the raccoon or the monkey. When, when we lose a pet, when our children lose a pet, what do we do? We, we post it out on, on social media. We put it in Zealand or Formed or Holland and Formed. Or we put it out on Facebook or we put it out on Instagram. Help us find. Right? And, and, and then we go searching around the neighborhood. We walk from one place to the next. Or we, we get in our car and we drive around. And even sometimes we'll begin to expand our search. And, and we'll make little posters. And we'll put them on on telephone poles, and we'll begin to post them around. Help us, if you've seen this dog, if you've seen this cat, please call this number. And, and if we find that dog, what do we do? Or when we find that cat, we're like, oh, I am so overwhelmed, so joyful. We take a hold of that cat, or we take a hold of that dog, and we, we celebrate. <coughs> a few years ago, uh, my brother-in-law was at our house on a time during Thanksgiving, and he had brought his dog along, and the dog at midnight, he had let out to go to the bathroom, and the dog had just taken off, run away. And so we together started searching around our neighborhood, and for the next hour, we searched around the neighborhood for this dog, until we had found this dog, and my brother-in-law did not 
embrace that dog and go back to it. brother-in-law did not enjoy. But Jesus doesn't stop there. Do we realize how far Jesus takes this story? It's not just the intimacy of being held and holding us up. It's not just the joy of what it calls us Jesus. But Jesus tells us in this story, and, and he invited his friends, and he invited his neighbors. I find it fascinating that Jesus says, not only am I so excited that someone is found that I invite my friends, those who know me, but I invite my neighbors, those who are close. And I invite them to celebrate with me. I invite them to my house for a party because the one who is lost is not found. Rejoice with me. And so that's the second setting that Jesus said. And then Jesus puts it in the third setting and he says, and I tell you, as he looks at the Pharisees and the scribes, I tell you, the ones who paid attention to all the details, in the kingdom of heaven, in heaven, this is what is like. There is more joy over one sinner who's lost that comes to know Christ. And there is over all 99 who already are in the saving relationship with Christ. <laughs> Do we know what it means first to experience the joy of being found in our own life? For those of you who are followers of Jesus here this morning, is it an overwhelming sense of joy that you are found, that the love of God that we just sang about has been realized in your life, that the love of God that expressed Christ in a stable, in a manger wrapped in swaddling cloth, in the love of God that's expressed in the writing, th walking through the pages of the gospel, in miracle, in teaching, in healing, in discipleship, the, the love of Christ that's expressed in the betrayal, the love of Christ that's expressed expressed in the arrest, in the injustice of a trial, in a crucifixion, the love of God that's expressed in a death. And all of that, because by his wounds we are healed. And then the love of God in the resurrection where Christ is alive. Do, do we first experience the fullness of that joy within our own life of being found? I, I was just sharing with someone that I graduated from Western Theological Seminary. Some of you also attended there. I, I attended a hundred years ago. But I'll never forget the first time I ever took communion. I have all these communion stories, don't I? First time I ever took communion at Western Theological Seminary is a Friday. I was standing in the old assembly hall that's now been torn down. As I was standing, I was standing right next to this this kid called Trey Johnson, who's now Dr. Trey Johnson, he's the dean of chapel over at Hope College. And on that day, we did it by intention, and we shared it by intention, and so someone took the bread, and they turned, and they said, the body of Christ broken for you, and you would tear it off by yourself, and then they'd turn, and you'd say, the blood of Christ shed for you, and you'd take that piece of bread, and then you'd dip it. And so it was my turn. I was a first-year student. He was a third-year student. He was going to graduate this year. I had been there all 10 minutes at that point. And I took and I took the bread and I turned to him and I said, the body of Christ broken for you. And, and I had grown up in the church where when you did that, you, you ripped off a piece that was about the size of your fingernail. Just enough that you could hold real carefully at the very edge and then when you would dip it in the cup, it would just get just a touch, just a little bit. Like you only deserve a touch, just a little bit. And then you would be like, mm, that was so delicious. They'd say, this is a feast, a communion. And you'd be like, feast? I need to go to Kentucky Fried Chicken afterwards. I turned to Trey and I said, the body of Christ was broken for you. And he absolutely shocked me. And he ripped off a piece of bread about the size of a baseball. <laughs> and immediately I was like, what's going on here? And then when I turned and I took the chalice, I said to him, the blood of Christ shed for you. And I could barely get it out because I was more curious about what was going to happen in that moment. And, and he took his, his baseball piece of bread and he dipped it down in there and he pulled it out. And he sat in the front row of Sidley Paul, Western Theological Seminary, and he ate the body of Christ and the blood of Christ. It was an apple. And it took more than one bite. And he sat there and he went like, you know, um, and it's dripping down his hand. 
And, and I am not focused at all on what's happening in this moment of communion. I am more curious about what's happening to Trey. And he finishes up, and then he did something I will never, ever forget. He rubs his hands, and he goes, in the middle of communion. I mean, can you imagine what the scribes and Pharisees would say? Afterwards, I was curious enough. I was inquisitive enough. We were leaving, and I said, Trey, please help me. What just happened? <laughs> and he said, every day I walk into this place, I think, why did God choose me? He could send anyone else. I'm not worthy of any of this. And so when God offers me his grace, when God offers me the nourishment for my faith, I'm going to take as much as I can. And I'm going to eat it as the feast. Friends, first, first, have you experienced the joy, the overwhelming joy, the resurrected joy, the truth that you have been saved? And if this is true for you, does your life reflect that joy? And if it's not true for you, let me invite you into the most joy-filled expression of true life you can experience. That's the first thing. Here's the second. Are we then also entering into the joy of what it means for others to be found? That the world in which we live needs a savior, needs to know that God loves them so passionately. I know we in the North American church have turned it into something that it never was supposed to be. But when we truly read the story, when we truly read the story of Jesus, when we realize that in the front row, it was tax collectors and sinners. And in the back row, it was a peanut gallery of complainers and grumblers, and those were the religious folks. You see, that's why the boulevard is so important. When churches live and are established for a long time, we sometimes forget that we exist because God so loved the world. And that our purpose is to share the love of God with the world around us. So back to Trail West in Buena Vista, Colorado. I've decided that day I'm not worthy. And you know, the truth is, I was right. It's because we're not worthy. And for some reason, this this lady, maybe five foot two, she would have weighed 135 pounds with cement blocks tied to her ankles. <laughs> she, she stepped in to the aisle. She walked down and then she stepped into the pew in front of me and she slid all the way down that pew. And she looked me square in the eyes and she said, Jonathan, the body of Christ. Because like I've been found. And in being found, to be reminded that Jesus did what he did for me. And in being found, I needed to share with others joyfully. You see, that's what the table's all about. Technically, we call this a feast of remembrance and communion and hope. And the reason we call it remembrance is because we remember what Christ has done for us. And we remember what Christ has done for others. But that's not all. It's not just about remembering. It's about communion. That in this table, there is the presence, the real presence of Jesus with us. That we don't just partake of this in, 
in some kind of willy-nilly that instead we we live in this holy moldy Jesus is here. And, and then this hope. This hope that Jesus is going to gather from the edge of the world into one loaf. From the gathering of all these vines around the world into one cup. That this is a picture, a feast. Whatever happens this morning when our elders hand out communion, please don't give out fingernail sized pieces. You probably don't have enough bread to give out baseball sized pieces. <laughs> but to be reminded that this is a feast, a feast where we remember what God has done for us through Jesus. <coughs> and so, friends, in our remembering, we hear these words. On the night in which he was betrayed, Christ took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And said, This is my body, broken for you. As often as you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. And after they had had the supper together, took the cup, pouring it out, he said, This is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. The cup which we drink and the bread which we break is communion with the blood and the body of Christ. So some instructions. There will be two stations up here this morning. You'll come forward. They'll break off a piece of bread for you and they'll hand it to you. You'll hear these words, the body of Christ broken for you. Some people, when they hear those words, they're silent. Some people say, Amen, hallelujah. Please get whatever expression is natural for you this morning. And you'll take that piece of bread and you'll dip it in the cup again. The blood of Christ shed for you again through silence or overwhelming sense of hallelujah. Here's the one thing I will say. For those of you who don't feel like you're worthy this morning, you are. You are worthy not because of what you've done, but because of what God has done in His love through Jesus Christ. The gifts of God.